the heart. As we discussed over the last couple of weeks, the condition of the heart in every area of our life, that we have to evaluate one of the most pressing issues that we all deal with. It's something that sometimes could be the elephant in the room in our relationships, and it's finances. And we discuss finances, um, all of a sudden the, the, the fear comes up. Uh, what, what are we going to talk about? Are we going to have to be honest about our integrity when it talks about our finances? And today we're talking about the spirit that we have in the heart about being generous towards God. But when we look at what finance, healthy financials look like, look at our life and look at what we do and how we give and why we do certain things, I want to give to you, hopefully you've already understood this, but I want to give to you a new principle, a principle that is found in the Word of God of why we do certain things. I believe when we talk about giving, we we automatically start thinking of, of we have to give to the church, and so the church can do certain things, or we have to give for uh, to honor God. And I want to give to you a principle found in Luke chapter 16 that is going to be hopefully awe-inspiring to you about why you give, why you give. And if we understand there's a reason why God has called us to give, then it gives us a freedom to say, I want to do this not because of what I get out of it, because it's what God's heart is. You know, we have to remember that Jesus came to seek and to save those which were lost. He didn't come here to build necessarily a building, or he didn't come to do great things. He came for one purpose in particular, and that's to seek and to save those which are lost. So when Jesus is teaching here in Luke chapter 16, he goes right out from the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 and and how the prodigal son went in righteous living and he came back to his father. Right after Luke chapter 15 and he's talking about the prodigal son, he talks about a guy by the name of an unjust steward or a bad manager. He talks about this bad manager, and he calls it, and he said, he said, the master has heard that the manager of his plantations, or the manager of his wealth, or the manager of his, of his uh, farms was unjust, was embezzling, was throwing his money away in crazy lifestyles. And he got upset about that, so he called his manager to him, and he said, he said, you have... I I have found out that you have been wasting your money, my money. And he said, you are not worthy of being my manager. You're fired. So the guy said, what am I going to do? I I don't know what to do. This is all I know. I know how to manage things. I know how to to invest money, and I, I don't have a job anymore. And he said, I'm too old to dig, and I'm too proud to beg. So he had this epiphany moment. And he said, I know what I'm going to do. I know the custom of the day that I know everybody that the master, the owner of everything has. I know the debts. I'm going to call all of those that have debt into my house. And I'm going to settle a debt with them. So he calls in his debtors. The Bible gives us two debtors, but it's, a, it's assumed that all of his debtors came in. He gave us two ideas. The first debtor came in. He said, how much do you owe? I owe him a hundred uh, bushels of wheat. He said, hurry up, write 50 on it, sign it, and that's what you owe. Of course, if somebody, the IRS came to you and said, said how much do you owe? I owe $3,000. Make it 1500 We're good. Okay, we're going to sign off on that. Because the guy that offered you the compromise said, sign off, we're good. So they did. The next guy comes in, he says, how much do you owe? I owe 100 uh, uh, grains of oil. He said, write 80 on it, and we're good. So he writes 80 on it. So the owner hears what the businessman did. He cut it in half. And each one of those is about two years' salary that he made. So he's making a lot of money down the road. And if he had 15 to 20 or 30 debts and he made a year, year and a half salary on each one of them, the guy is really making some profit. The owner heard what he did. And he said this. He gave him a compliment. He said, you are a shrewd businessman. He gave him a compliment about what he did. He didn't say you're a good guy. The Bible says he's an unrighteous servant. 
He's a bad man. But the owner said, you are a shrewd man. You took what I had and I gave to your prophet and you took it and you embezzled it and you swandled it. But you're a good, shrewd investor, but you're not invested with your money. And we look at that and say, how could that analogy that Jesus gave as a parable connect with us today? Well, the Bible says that the unrighteous acts more shrewdly than the, sin, the sons of men. In other words, that the, the unsaved or the world's philosophy, they care more about themselves and they will do whatever they need to do to build a future for themselves. They will do whatever it takes to gain profit for their investments into the future. He said, the unrighteous act more shrewdly than the sons of God, than the Christians do about the future of God. So here's where the parallel comes in. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to verse 9. I want to give you three simple principles that I believe is so overwhelming that when you look at these, you understand the principle of giving. Okay? Verse 9 says this. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you in the everlasting home. Well, Bruce, what's, what's that talking about? As I say to you, this is to the believers now. He's talking to his disciples. And I say to you, Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. What's unrighteous mammon? Unrighteous mammon is the money system of the day. Unrighteous mammon is our cash flow. Finances, our monies on this earth are not the heavenly currency. It is what we use in this world. It is unrighteous because it's not going to last forever. When we pass away, our resources are going to be passing away. We may give it an inheritance, we may, we may pass it down, but our monies, our investments, our material wealth is only temporary. It's only for a short time. So it's unrighteous. It's unspiritual mammon, money. But use your unspiritual, unhealthy mammon to do God's work. How do we do that? If we can't take money with us, if we can't take possessions with us when we die, how are we ever going to put up into heaven the blessings for our future? How are we going to do that? Well, I was in uh, India a few years ago. I had the privilege of going to India, and I was speaking at a couple churches, and, and the pastor met the pastors that were flying over there. The pastor of the church met us there, and he goes, guys, uh, you're not going to believe this. I told the church that uh, you guys were flying in, and it was like at 9.30 at night, and, and uh, we flew in, and the pastor said, you're not going to believe this, but uh, my whole church is outside waiting for you. I said, what are they waiting for us? So when we pulled up to the gate, we got our luggage, they were lined up down the gate, a couple, three hundred church members, and they all had our names on signs, and they were holding the signs up, and they, we walked through, and they were cheering for us like, well, like we were somebody important, and I don't care who you are. If somebody's chanting your name and there's 200 of them, they're going, that's pretty cool, man. I mean, this is awesome. I don't even know them. They don't know me. I hope I don't bomb tomorrow morning in my sermon. But you know what? They were cheering me on because of the position that I held. That is the, exactly what this picture looks like in verse 9. Here's the idea. We cannot take stuff to heaven with us. What we have to do is we have to send the stuff ahead of us. What happens? This is the point that is unbelievable to me. Every penny, every possession, every gift that I give to a person, to an entity, to a church, to a foundation, or to a mission, when that person, place, entity, invest that money, and somebody, whoever it is, gives their life to Christ. That person that has been saved through the power of your influence, through the possessions that you have given, your name is written on their hearts. When you gain access to heaven, when you pass away, everything that you have sent forth from you to heaven 
is accountable to your account. And when you walk into the pearly gates, when you stand before God, when you usher yourself into the gates of heaven, every person, every person that has been impacted by a penny that you have given, thousands that you have given, time that you have spent, or you have made bow down yourself with them and accepted Christ with them, that person is going to stand with you and they are going to usher you into the very gate of heaven. Wow. Why do you give? You give for eternal purposes. Not for money. Not to get. We have to look. We have 70 years promised to us on this earth. 70 years. If we work and work and work and sacrifice and sacrifice and we invest, invest, invest for ourselves, we can have a great life. We can have a great retirement. We can have a great time in those 70 years. But Jesus... He's looking at an eternity. And he is saying, you can invest for yourself for 70 years, and you can have a great life for those 70 years. And that's what the world does. They sacrifice, they are shrewd in what they do. And they can have a great life for 70 years. But at the end of 70 years, guess what? It's over. It's done. You can't do anything else. The time of using resources is over the moment that you die. The only way that you can secure heavenly investments is when God allows you to use his resources now to send future investments to heaven through communicating God's love and salvation to those in this world. Every person in this world. Not just in Wichita, Kansas. God loves every person. Every person. There's not a person, there's not a country, there's not a race that God does not absolutely adore. And we as a church, we adore every person that walks in this room. Whether race, whether economic status, whether they're wealthy, they're poor, whether they look like us or whether they don't. The purpose of the church is to give out God's love and to give to them the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. When we have that heart, when we have that mindset, when we know I have given my life, I have given my resources to God for a purpose, that's to invest in eternal rewards, not just physical rewards, not just more stuff, not just so I can have more things, not so I can just retire faster, It's, I can do my job. I can live a good life. I can invest into my retirement. But I have a bigger picture. I'm not going to live for 70 years. If we're a child of God, if we have given our life to Christ, if we have been saved and we understand who Christ is, we are only temporary in these 70 years. After that, eternity. Eternity. And he says this. He says, that's just unrighteous mammon. That's just resources. That's just resources. That's just money. There's going to be a day that your money is gone. What do you have? What do you have the day that you die? The only thing that we have is what we have sent forth ahead of us. And the day that you stand before God, and the day that you see hundreds and thousands of people that say, it's because of you. It's because of your sacrifice. It's because of the 20 bucks. It's because of the $1,000 that you gave. It's because of the prayer that you gave. It's because of the opportunity that you witnessed. Those people are going to say to you, thank you when you enter. Those are the people that are going to say, it's because of you. And God is going to give you real riches. Not financial riches. Real, spiritual, godly future in heaven for eternity. We can't sacrifice 70 years For eternity, we have to understand what is it all about? What is it all about? We have to look at the attitude towards others. Make friends, buy friends for heavenly places, use our resources to reach people for the cause of Jesus Christ. In uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 and through 21, it says this Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, where is it? There your heart will be also. 
Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. When we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, we understand this, our attitude towards ourselves. We have to look at our attitude towards others. That's why we give, so we can reach other people for Christ. The purpose of the church, the purpose of our life, is not to gain access for our own self. But it's to use the resources that God has blessed us with to give to God so God can use it to bless others, to, to minister to others so they can see Christ. That's why missions is important. That's why it's very important that we go into all the world, preach the gospel. That's why it's important that we as a church, we don't get so inward focused that we don't serve God on the outside. We don't reach people for Jesus Christ. But let's look at the attitude for ourselves in verses 10 and 12. And who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. But who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? That's big words, true riches. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? If you're not faithful in what's called unrighteous mammon, if you're not faithful in just your financial obligations, if you're not faithful towards God in just giving, being a generous spirit, honoring God with what he already owns. If you're not faithful in unfamine or unrighteous mammon, you're not going to gain true riches. Now, what is the true riches? The true riches are the things that we gain from God. We can't get on our own. We can't get God's blessing. If we are unfaithful in the little things, you're going to be unfaithful in the large things. But if you are faithful in the small things, then God has the ability to bless you and honor you and give to you things you can't even comprehend, ask, or imagine. Those are the true riches. Those are the blessings. Those are the blessings that stand before you for an eternity, saying thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your sacrifice. The real riches are what God gives to us. The blessings, the peace, the crowns, the God loves you to a point that he wants to bless you with true riches. See, we think in our physical minds that wealth is the most important thing. The more I gain, the more successful I am. The more I have, the more I have to work to gain more things. We think wealth and materialism is the priority of life. That is the world's philosophy of the unjust steward. God says, no, 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 no. It is not how much you possess. It's not how much money you have. It's what you do with the money you have. Because here's the deal. When I only have money and what I can get, I keep, and it's all mine, you are getting what you deserve. And you can have that, and you can invest that, and you can have that for your 70 years, and you can be happy and say, look what I have. I have all I need. I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to tear it down, and I'm going to live. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry till I die. And you can do that. Or you can say, what I have is God's. I am going to be faithful in the little things, and if I'm faithful in the little things, God will be faithful to me in the greater things. So if we become wealthy, and we are a conduit that God can bless us through our wealth, through our resources, through our material, if we have that, God is then a conduit that more I give, God blesses because he's found us faithful in unrighteous mammon. He can give us the real true blessings through God's blessing, through his purpose, through his will. Why? Is because the goal of finances, spiritually, is how many people can I invest in so they can see Jesus Christ and give their life to Christ. We are not here for resources. We are not here to get as a child of God, we have to be shrewd in what we're doing. We have to understand spiritual health in the financial arena is giving God the opportunity to bless us because we're faithful in the little things. If he can't find us faithful in the unrighteous mammon, monies that's not going to last, things that are going to burn away, if he can't find us faithful in the 70 years, what are we going to have for an eternity? We all know 
that once we give our life to Christ, we're going to heaven. We're all going to be in the presence of God in heaven if we know Christ. But what do we do? What do we have? What do we have to lay down at God's feet? The true riches is what we have invested in. How many lives have we impacted? How many souls have been saved? How many prayers have we offered? How many sharings of our testimony have we given? How many times will somebody say, because of you, I bowed my face before God and I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Those names, those names of people we have never met, those names of people in, in India, in Cuba, in Africa, in Asia, those people that we have sent missionaries to, that we have impacted because of your offerings, those people are going to have your name on their heart, and they will be bowing down, worshiping you, and thanking you for giving to them the opportunity to see Christ. That is the purpose for giving. The purpose for giving to allow people to have faith. We have to get our eyes off of unrighteous mammon. And put our eyes on the purpose of unrighteous mammon is to build friends so they can see Christ. To understand that we have to be faithful in the small things. And if we're faithful in the small things, God will give to us things that we can't even comprehend. Things that we will never be able to deserve on our own. The true riches. True riches. Things that when it happens, you're thinking, how'd that happen? Blessings that we can't even comprehend. Things when you look at it and you say, I don't understand how that happened. Well, God did that. I didn't do it. When I look at what God has done for us, we can say, that is the hand of God. Money can't buy that. Position can't get that. It has to be from the power of God. And those are the true riches. We have to have a heavenly perspective. The purpose of our life is for an eternal perspective. Not 70 years. Not today. Not am I happy not am I wealthy? Eternal perspective is, is what I'm doing today impacting people's lives for eternity? And when we have that perspective, then we can understand the last two verses, verses 13 and 14. It says this, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will also be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Either one is going to be in charge. Now, in this context of the scripture, he's saying either you're going to be like the unjust steward, the manager that only thought about himself. He was embezzling. He was stealing money. He was, he was doing everything he could for himself. He didn't want to work. He didn't want to beg. He just wanted to think about himself and what he was going to do. And it's all about money. How can I get, 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 get? And the Bible says he is unrighteous. He was unfit. He was stealing. He was a man that only thought of himself. He was thinking of money, money, money. Investment, investment. Me, me, me. He said, you can either serve mammon or you can serve God. But I promise you, if you only serve mammon, money, God cannot bless you. But he said this, if your servanthood, if your devotion, if you love and your love is God, God then uses you with resources in order so you can buy friends in heaven. So you can take people with you so they can be your eternal reward in heaven. If you have a passion for God, God will give to you true riches, true blessings, things that you can't get on your own. You can't serve God and money. You have to make a decision. And the decision is very simple. Am I going to live my life for 70 years? Me, me, me. Or am I going to live my 70 years for eternity? Many times we sacrifice what we don't see for what we do see. We have to put our minds on things that are unseen because the things that are unseen are eternal. But the things we see, they're temporary. I can tangibly handle that. I can see that. I understand what I need. I want that. So I can understand I'm going to give everything I can to get what I can see. But the Bible says our rewards 
are in heaven. The true riches are in heaven. We cannot sacrifice what we see in 70 years for what we have believed in our heart that Jesus died for, and that's our eternal security in heaven with God forever. What do we sacrifice for? What do we give for? My last verse is probably a verse that we have read many times. It says, give. Just say, be generous, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will he put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. If we are stuck financially, if we're stuck in a mindset of me, when we send what God wants us to use to heaven, the measure that we send it to God through any entity, through any mission organization that reaches people for Jesus Christ, through the church, through evangelists, through anybody that shares the love of Jesus Christ, any individual, the measure that you share your love and your resources too, is the measure it will be given back to you. It may not be 50-50. You give 50, God's going to give you 50 back. It may be so much better than that. We think of unrighteous mammon as the blessing. That, in God's eyes, is nothing. He uses resources to have a bigger perspective of security in heaven a future in heaven. It's our names that we have sent ahead. That's what the priority is. I love the idea of thinking that every penny I've given, every dollar I have spent, every place that I've gone to share the gospel, every prayer that I've, I've offered up in a hospital room, every wedding that I've ever performed that I put Jesus Christ as the priority, Everything that I've ever shared, every message that I've ever given, every dollar that you've ever offered, every time that you've prayed with somebody at the altar, every time your kids come and talk to you, and maybe they're having problems, and, and you take the godly effect and you pray with them, and their friends come over and you're talking to them about Christ, and maybe you're giving them resources and they're giving it back to God. Every time we invest in somebody's life, we are paying it forward, so to speak, spiritually. And one day, one day, at the end of our life, we close our eyes, our life is over. The opportunity to invest, to use unrighteous mammon, is done. Can't pay anything forward anymore. The investment that you've given is given. Your retirement has started. The real, true riches is about ready to be seen. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I close my eyes down here. I'm in the presence of God instantaneously in heaven. What do I see? What do I feel? What do I experience? Well, there's a song. It's an old song. It's an old school song called Thank You. What will I experience? The invitation today is not at the altar. The invitation today is in your heart. It's a contemplation. What am I doing? Am I sacrificing my life for 70 years? Or am I investing in eternity? My soul wants to follow after Christ. My source, my resource, my passion, my family, my love has to be a bigger more focused, more direct. I want to give everything that I have to the one that gives me everything I need. And when I understand that God is the supplier, that I can do whatever God wants me to do because he's going to take care of every need that I have, I can be a conduit. Thank you. When you hear those words from people you've never met, because of what you've done, because God has offered that to you. That is your eternal reward. Not resources. That's nothing to God. The soul 
of those that have given their life to Christ. It's what puts a smile on God's face. And he's using you as a tool to win people for Jesus Christ. Listen to this song.